Hi there. They did a uh, call to last minute wardrobe audible at the uh, back there, so if I look a little disheveled, you'll know why. Uh, well, it's great to be here. I'm an alumnus of the University of Nevada, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to talk about something that I think is a very interesting topic right now that I call the transformational life. You know, we often think of ourselves as living in the information age, but I would suggest that in the last five years, something profound has shifted for us as a civilization, as a species worldwide, and that is that, you know, we've become an interconnected family for the very first time on a single planetary biosphere, a very precious place, of course, we call Earth. Now, if I asked a question by show of hands, how many here feel like life is getting more complex and perhaps less certain? For those of you who are watching at home, almost every hand in the audience went up. We're going to talk a little bit about that today, but it's fundamental to the shift that, that we're going through. And you wouldn't be alone in making this observation. Um, Fast Company, as long, along with many other uh, magazines, are pointing out that we're in a time of massive chaos, that this is generation flux. You know, how do we adapt to this? What's our ways of being that are adequate as a reply to this particular time in human history? Joshua Kubaramo uh, talks about the age of the unthinkable, and of course we remember Nicholas Taleb's Black Swan. It was, uh, you know, this idea that these nonlinear events can come along and really disrupt a lot of our uh, structures that we've come to rely on. Jeremy Rifkin just recently has released The Empathic Civilization where he's making the observation that as, a, as we birth into global consciousness, we're going to need a new kind of empathy. And I think he's fundamentally right. But let's look back over the last several thousand years and just uh, see if what we can learn about the evolution of complexity itself. So if we go back 12,000 years to hunting and gathering era um, to 10,000 BCE, the average society size in this time was about 40 people, okay? A few thousand years later, we move into the horticultural era with the invention, believe it or not, the invention of the digging stick. The digging stick allows us to cultivate plants and, of course, produce, um, uh, produce food that we can then sort of create settlements around. The society size goes to 1,500 people. It's about 8,000 B.C., and of course it lasts for several thousand years until we get to the agrarian era. Society size makes a major bump up to 100,000 people on average. This really was uh, promulgated by the invention of the plow. What the plow allowed us to do is get even deeper into the soil, uh, you know, pulled by an ox, and get more productivity out of every acre of soil that there was. And of course we can support a larger population. So what we're seeing is these technological innovations continue to support in some fundamental way the growing size, average size of the society. Several thousand years later, we get to the industrial era. Average society size in the industrial era goes up to 10 million people. Uh, this is an era that, of course, is kicked off, yeah, you might argue, with the invention of the printing press, which you know, led to sort of the enlightenment thinking. Um, the invention of the spinning jenny the invention of the steam engine, and all of the industrial revolution of the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. You can see where this story is going. We get to the information age, birthed by first the telegraph, then the radio, then television. 1947, the invention of the transistor. Okay, really does something as, that's kind of a watershed. It gives rise to the personal computer revolution for the next four or five decades, eventually with its capstone achievement in the early 1990s of the World Wide Web. Average society size is now 100 million people. If you've been following along with the math here, you understand where this goes next. We are entering an era right now in our lifetime, in this generation, started in the past five years, where we are a society, single society, of seven billion people, interconnected in real time, on a single planetary biosphere as a single human family. This was enabled arguably because of a couple of technological innovations. One is the spread of high-speed data networks, and the second is the spread of smartphones. 
There's a billion and a half smartphones deployed, give or take a few hundred million. Today, that number is growing to four and a half billion over the next six, six seven, eight years. So think about that. We're going to have a majority of the human species interconnected in real time with data access, not just communication, but data access in the next 10 years. And this is what it feels like. Now, one of the effects, among many of the effects, is that it gives us a sense of overload. It gives us a sense of overload. We are exposed to more daily perspectives than ever before. That's a measure of the complexity. We're, we are exposed to more job choices. We have more religious options. We have more life partner choices. I could go on the internet today and try to find a life partner in South Africa who fit the precise thing that I was sort of looking for right now. It's an extraordinary explosion of innovation, but it also presents a profound challenge, doesn't it? And we all feel it. The challenge is that as this as this complexity has really gone off the charts, you might argue the central nervous system, the human central nervous system, is not actually evolved to handle this level of complexity. It's not evolved to handle this level of choice making in, in every aspect of our lives. Now, what does transformational actually mean? To transform literally means to change the shape of. Change the shape of. Well, what's changing shape? Everything. As we've seen today and you see throughout the TED Talks around the world, everything's changing shape. Educational processes, governance processes, political processes. The Arab, Arab Spring Revolution is, is an example of something that you know, may in past years, taken years and years and decades. Now these structures, these deep structures of our lives can change in months. There's several thousand alternative currency systems that have popped up just in the last 10 years. And that's going to continue to happen because the deep structures of anything can change whenever we're sharing our attitudes, we're sharing perspectives, and as that happens, our energy changes. We're like a big school of fish. Our energy, our spending habits, our value systems are all inter in intertwining with each other, which means there's just like the plow is sort of unearthing the soil at its roots, that's what's happening now at every, every level of our lives. And of course it feels deeply unsettling. The transformational life is a reply to that. Unfortunately, at this moment, we're still in a bit of trouble. Three in four adults don't have, can't meet the mental demands of modern life. The developmental psychologists tell us that the average adult is in over their heads as it relates to the mental demands of modern life. And it's understandable why, when you look at the sort of the hockey chart. Two and three adults are either overweight or obese, and one in two Americans is going to have a chronic disease in less than seven years. What does this tell us? One of the things it tells us is that I would just say the dopamine addiction systems are winning. At a time where life is very uncertain, it's very complex, there are easy outlets that are going to scale that we're grabbing onto. Now dopamine is the neurotransmitter in our brain that is a reward system. It feels really good. There's a reason why Facebook has a billion plus members and did it fairly quickly. McDonald's sells more than a billion hamburgers a month. Apple sells more than a billion app downloads a month. And Xvideos, the largest pornography site in the world, has four and a half billion, there's only seven billion people on the planet, four and a half billion unique page views a month 30%, full 30% of all the data traffic worldwide is related to pornography. These are easy dopamine addiction systems in a time of uncertainty. I'm going to suggest that there are several shifts that we're going to undergo. And that the faster we undergo them, the more consciously we undergo them, the better off we're all going to be. To some degree, I think the calling of the transformational era, the calling of the transformational life, is to find simplicity on the other side of all that complexity. I think that's the adaptive requirement of our generation. Certainly it's the adaptive requirement of us as parents, and it's what me and my wife and many of our friends are beginning to try to educate our children around is shifts like the ones we're gonna talk about, and clearly there's many more that we, we could discuss. So the first thing is we're gonna have to grow in discernment. 
We're going to have to grow in discernment. This is a shift from being insulted to being informed. We're going to get exposed to more perspectives than ever before. Not all of them are right, but all of them are something we can learn from. So rather than have our, our self get scared, being exposed to difference, being exposed to otherness, we have to lean into that. We have to lean into it so that we can encounter otherness, we can encounter other worldviews and become informed by them. And it's fundamentally a process of growing in discernment, growing in wisdom. The second, we're going to have to make a shift in ourself from scared to sacred. A lot of what we've heard today and, and what's, what is popular amongst a lot of the TED speakers is this shift, this shift of moving to a self that's not terrified of life, that doesn't believe the myth that we're just this skin-encapsulated ego in a terrifying, cold, lonely world. All the great contemplative traditions tell us that by going inward, we can go beyond. By going inward, we can go beyond the narrow confines of a self that feels small, whether through contemplative prayer, through meditation, what have you. This will be a requirement of this generation for people that want to lead a healthy, happy, full, productive life. This is such an important one. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to learn to stand out, move from standing out to kneeling down. It's, you know, when I was a kid, to, to, to sort of grow up, to fit in, you just had to not stand out. Right now, a lot of what we're teaching our children is that to stand out, I'm sorry, to stand up, you have to stand out. That exceptionalism is the new average. How many Facebook friends do you have? You know, what's going on on Twitter, etc. So for the parent who, who kept her daughter off Facebook, you know, good for you, right? Because this is an insidious myth that's going on at the core of this, which is fundamentally about narcissism. We're teaching our kids that to be average, they actually have to be extraordinary. Well, anybody that knows anything about math knows that doesn't work, right? The math doesn't work. And also it robs us of the dignity, which is still true, which is that you're unique. You have a unique contribution to make. And you don't need to stand out in some extraordinary way to be important. CEOs have the lowest emotional intelligence in the workforce. Fact. We're in a paradigm where we believe that by being greedy, by achieving financial success, we can outrun a lot of what we fear. That may have been true in 1980. It may have been true in 1950. It will not be true in 2020 for a lot of these same reasons. We are interconnected. We're going to have to move from egonomics to true economics. Now, the paradox of this is that we actually, by recognizing the genuine scarcity that the planet has, by recognizing the genuine scarcity the planet has, we can actually move into a mindset of abundance because we can start taking care of each other. We can start building businesses that are conscious. We can start building businesses that aren't only for the profit maximization of a few. Why? Because we're going to have to. This is not only, doesn't only make good moral sense, it's going to be a pragmatic requirement of this generation. We're also going to have to grow in empathy from looking at each other. So, you know, if we look back at the election um, and, and the processes that lead up to the election, this is one of my favorites because it's obvious that the, the, the move in the political process is just to objectify other perspectives so quickly and look at them, right? But genuine empathy relies on us being able to get into the seat of the other and look as them. It's actually a difficult move, especially when we don't want to. And usually when we don't want to, it's precisely when we should. I want to close with an invitation. I think it's the invitation that, if I could be poetic, was sent 14 billion years ago. The heart of the Big Bang. This invitation made its way to us now, and it says, congratulations, you're the first self-aware species in the known universe who is interconnected to every other member of its species, 
on a single planetary biosphere. It's never happened. It's an extraordinary opportunity for us. It's an extraordinary time to be alive. It also has real challenges. I think the invitation invites us to move into and beyond fear, into and beyond a scared sense of self, into and beyond egonomics, into and beyond looking at each other just as objects and being able to genuinely relate to each other empathically. I think this invitation says nothing less then move beyond fear for your own life and for that of a civ- as a civilization and expand our capacity for love. Thank you very much.